Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Upper Room Fellowship of Jesus Christ Sabbath message. I'm Pastor Rufus, and I have with me Sister Joanna. And Sister Joanna will be opening this message by lead, leading us in a song. But before we go to her, let's go to our Lord in prayer. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for the privilege of delivering uh, parts of your word and a song to this audience here today for the Sabbath message, Lord. And we just pray that you'll be with us all. Be with everyone who's listening. Be with Joanna and I as we present your words and song. And just lead and guide us, Lord, and put your spirit upon my lips and her lips in our hearts and put your spirit upon the ears of those who are listening so they may retain, hear and retain the words that you have for them and the message that's specific to each and every one of them. And Lord, we thank you for all these things. We thank you for blessing us and we thank you for keeping us in all things, Lord. And we just pray that you'll continue your wonderful work among everyone here today. And we <clears throat> give you all the honor, all the praises, and all the glory. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. And now, Sister Joanna. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Oh, the prayer of our hearts should always be that God will work in and through us, making us the servants that he created us to be so that we really and truly can be fruitful. So this song is a simple song dedicated to um, all of us that really want the Lord to take over our lives. Make me a servant, humble and meek. Lord, let me lift up those who are weak, and may the prayer of my heart always be, make me a servant, make me a servant, make me a servant today. Lord, take the clay of my life in your hands. Mold me and make me unto your plan. Lord, let the prayer of my heart always be. Make me your servant. Oh, make me your servant. Make me your servant today. Lord, help your people to walk close to you. Guide us and lead us to represent you. And may the prayer of our hearts always be Make us your servants, oh, make us your servants, please make us your servants today. Amen. Thank you, Sister Joanna. And now we'll go to our good news message Today, <clears throat> fruitfulness. Beginning with the introduction, today's Sabbath message reviews the biblical concepts of bearing fruit. The term fruit is used throughout scripture as symbolic representations of the blessings God desires to bring about through his people. The theme of fruitfulness reaches toward the ultimate goal God desires to manifest through his servants, even until the end of our journey upon earth. Now to our first passage today. Uh, 
And the caption here is, fruit given as tithes in the land is holy. And uh, passage is from Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30. And it reads, thus all the tithe of the land, of the seed of the land, or of the fruit of the tree is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. And, and now let's, let's focus on this just for a minute here. The tithes of the land, of the seed of the land, or of the fruit, is, is holy to the Lord. Now, we know that the ancient Israelites, uh, they, they gave their tithes and offerings from the products that they grew, uh, like, well, stock, either stock or uh, fruits or whatever that they, they used in their lives to sustain their lives, they offered some of that to the Lord. Now, for us here today, we know that those things are symbolics of our heart. The Lord really wants our hearts. So as they gave their fruits and, and animals for sacrifices and for tithing to the Lord, the Lord was actually looking at their hearts as they gave to note whether or not they were given from their hearts. And so these, the, the tithe here and the offerings were, were considered offerings of their hearts. And so therefore it is holy because that's where God desires to reside in us, in our hearts. And so when we, when we offer our hearts, it is holy, it is his. Amen. So let's move to our next passage here. And it's uh, <clears throat> action, a blessed man or woman. And for that, we'll read Psalm 1, verses 1 through 3. And the scripture reads, how blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season. And his leaf does not wither. And in whatever he does, he prospers. Amen. Now, note here, uh, the blessed man here is someone who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. Don't, don't uh, hang around and talk to those who we, we know are wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners. Same idea, just a different uh, uh, situation. Nor sit in the seat of scoffers. And all these are people who God despised, sinners, the wicked, scoffers. But instead, the blessed man's delight is in the law of the Lord, in, the, in his word. And in that word or in his law, he meditates day and night. Now, a person who God loves those who do such things. And, and here's the, the, what God does for them in return. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water. Now, also, now let's look a little deeper. Now, in, in scripture, trees are symbolic of people, like a tree. And so when, when the scripture says he will be like a tree, he will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and his leaf does not wither, and in whatever he does, he prospers. Now, God causes all these things. He causes him to be like a, a man who's representative of a tree or symbolic of a tree will be like a tree with all these blessings. That tree, he would be like a, not just any tree, but a tree that's firmly planted by streams of water. Now we know that water is what sustains plant life in a tree and, and causes it to grow and causes it to, to be a productive tree. But here, this goes beyond productive being productive, but it goes, a tree whose leaves does not wither. Does, have we ever seen anything like that? Well, 
No, we haven't unless God was doing it. And, and that's the point here, that the blessed man will be likened to something, uh, a tree that the, whose leaf does not wither, which means it, it doesn't deteriorate unless, of course, God allows it to. Now, let's look at some other uh, written comments on this very thing. The blessed man, when God's people walk in his word and seek him as described in the passage above, he blesses them with fruitfulness. That is, he causes them to be very productive, serving and leading others to him. That's, that's our fruitfulness. That's fruitfulness in God's people, is that we serve him. His productivity now raised far above ordinary human ability is like a tree whose leaves do not wither. Bearing his fruit every season, clearly God is working through him. Amen. Amen. And so, brothers and sisters, let us all be like the blessed man we just read about. And it, it takes according to the word, just meditating upon his look, meditating on his word and not walking with the wicked and the sinfulness. And, and walk with the Lord. Okay, so let's go to our next passage. The righteous flourish like a great cedar. Now, again, we have a symbol of, of a tree here, and but this is, we're talking about us, men and women here, but we're using the symbolic, the symbolism of a, of a tree to explain the message. And so we'll, we will see this throughout the word today. So. Keep that in mind when we're referring to trees and, and fruit and, and things that come from trees, it's really us in our hearts that, that is being talked about. And, and the Lord manages them as he manages these symbolic trees we're going to read about. He manages our hearts. Okay, Psalm 92, verses 12 through 15. The righteous man will flourish like the palm tree another tree, he will grow like a cedar in Lebanon, planted in the house of the Lord. They will flourish in the courts of our God. They will still yield, they will still yield fruit in old age. They shall be full of sap and very green to declare that the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there is no unrighteousness in him. Now again, we, we are looking at this symbolic representation of a tree, but this is to, to be applied to us in our hearts. Now let's, let's go, go through this passage as we did the last and, and, and see and, and, and look in depth at what it's saying here. The righteous man or woman, will flourish like the palm tree. And so it gives the example of a specific tree here. He will grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Now, and we, we know if you look up trees in Lebanon or, or cedar trees, they are cedar trees. They are, they are very uh, giant. They have giant uh, trunks and, 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 and the branches, the, the, you know, they are, strong built hardy trees that are uh, visibly superior to, to to other trees and but notice here he will go like a cedar in Lebanon however the difference planted in the house of the Lord and so being planted in the ground that symbolic the, the symbolism is transferred to the house of the Lord that's where he's planted and that's where the, the righteous man will flourish because his nourishments come from God. God nourishes us through our worship in him and, and uh, coming to the house of the Lord. And it goes on to say in verse 14, they, they will still yield fruit in old age. They shall be full of sap and very green to declare that the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there is no unrighteousness in him. 
And so these amazing qualities that God gives to trees, which we can see, and it's easy to say, well, wow, that is, that's amazing. Uh, no tree could do that. But well, God can cause us to do amazing things as well that no other person could do without him. Amen. Amen. So our next passage talks about the righteous fears the Lord, is blessed, walks with him, is fruitful in him. And for that, we'll look at Psalm 128, verses 1 through 4. And it reads, again, we'll start with being blessed. How blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. And we know throughout the Bible, we God the, talks about, or the word talks about walking in God's ways, walking with him. And when Jesus met the disciples, he said, follow me, learn to walk in my ways. That's basically what he was telling them. And that's what God desires in us. And this fear is not fear of that he's going to do something bad to us, but just the fear is just have a reverence and reverent respect for who God is. And, that, and that's, that's the fear that the, the scripture is talking about here. And, and uh, having that respect, and if you fear anything, you fear not having that respect because you know, if you don't, you're lost and no one wants to be lost. Everyone wants to be found by God. Everyone wants to be walking with God. In verse two, when you shall eat of the fruit of your hands, you will be happy and it will be well with you. Your wife shall be like a fruitful vine within your house, your children like olive plants around your table. Behold, for thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. Amen. Amen. Now, that's to look at the rewards, how God re rewards us in, 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 in human terms here, not like a tree. So we've, we've transferred this fruitfulness to human terms. Um, and so let's have a few more comments on that. A walking with God brings fruitfulness, which is basically what we just read. And, and, and again, in human terms, rather than the symbolic representation of a tree. And so, but here, note that we're transforming, transforming the, the symbolic uh, attributes or conditions of a tree to, to humans. And that's what the last passage did. As revealed in previous passages, as well as the one above, God blesses those who fear him and walk in his ways. He causes fruit to bear, blessing not only our lives, but life and those connected to us. He blesses the fruit of our hands and blesses the children around our tables, the fruit of our bodies, thus a happy life for those who fear him. Amen. Amen. Hey, now here we'll talk about the tree of life. Okay, now, now we know that the word here, these concepts of, of fruit and life are being transferred. Now, the tree of life is, is in, in some terms representative of a person of life, but the, or the life in a person because it all comes from God. The life in trees come from God as well as life in us. And, and the, the uh, writers here are using this symbolic representation to teach us. And so it's easier to teach us that a tree is planted by streams of water because we know what's supposed to happen there. Well, so we, want, we need to learn when we are walking with God and fearing him and, and meditating on his word, what will happen to us. And so, and that's what scripture is doing in this, in, in this manner here, in this, by using symbolism. So let's go to uh, Proverbs 11, verse 30, and read that. It says, the fruit of the righteousness, the fruit of the righteousness is a tree of life. 
and he who is wise wins souls. Okay, the righteous. Who is the righteous? The righteous is those who fear God, who walk in his ways. We, let's take that a little further to us here today, New Testament. Those who, who have faith in God, who believe in Christ, who's been baptized, God has taken away our sin by virtue of those things and by virtue of accepting Christ's death as his own death. And that's, that gives us life. So the fruit of righteousness, that is to say what stems from that belief and that faithfulness is a tree of life. And we're the trees, because now we get back to the symbolic representation of who we are using the tree. So we're the tree of life. Okay, and, and, and of course that proverb goes on to state something else, and he who is wise wins souls. Now that soul that a person, that God's people win, his wise people win, is in its, itself fruit. Something that comes out of this relationship with, with God is, is, is fruit. And when, when, when in a soul is God's fruit. And that's what his servants does. It produces fruit for him. Not produce it, but it uh, gives fruit on God's behalf. Well, God have, he gives fruit, God gives the fruit, but through his servants. I believe that's the correct uh, way to state what I want to state there. Hey, uh, now let's go to this passage. John, meaning John the Baptist, John questions the Pharisees' repentance. Okay, so, uh, so we'll read Matthew verse, uh, chapter three, verses one through three, and then we'll, we'll drop down and we'll read verse seven through 10. And the scripture reads, now in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is the one referred to by Isaiah the prophet when he said, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make way the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now here, let's, let's look at this. John is, of course, we know was a, the forerunner to Christ. And, and his, his role here, or his ministry is preparing people, alerting people to the one that was spoken of, who was prophesied is, is here. And, and, and he is here to baptize, to prepare people for them, to wash away their sins and to gain a confession of acceptance to this savior, the savior that they've been waiting for and who, who they've read about in the scripture. And of course, some don't believe him. And, and, uh, and we know everyone don't believe in, in, in Christ and still don't after all that he has done. But, uh, but here, unless John is here preparing the, those there in Judea to come out and be baptized and confess that uh, Christ is the one because Christ has already, the, has already appeared but many people don't know who he is. And John is trying to alert them saying he is here, come out and acknowledge him and, and uh, be baptized and confess your sins. And moving on to verse seven, when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who want you to free from the wrath to, wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Amen. And so John saw people that he knew about, and he knew that they weren't people who, who was in acceptance to the one who was, who was in, in, in the world and who, one who they've heard of and seen and maybe heard his messages, but not believe. And John knew that. And that's therefore his statement. If you coming to be one of you Pharisees or Sadducees, you're coming to be baptized. And he referred to them as a brood of vipers. 
Now that 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 is not a a, a good uh, something good to say to a person because of the nature of vipers. Uh, I've learned that vipers, when when uh, when when they are uh, being inseminated for reproduction, the male uh, goes is. Uh, the, the, the male's head is swallowed by the female and that in, in, injects the reproductive whatever they give into the female and, and she uh, is produced, you know, uh, the, the young come from that. And when they're born, when it's time for them to be born, they eat their way out of the female. So both the male and the female are destroyed to for in order for vipers to reproduce. Like a circle of death. Yes. And and so so John is is that's that's a terrible thing he's saying about the Pharisees and, and Sadducee. Someone who lives like that. It's not a very good way, not life is not very. Uh, good in them or blessed by God. And, and we know that's not something that God, the Lord is blessing. And therefore, that's what he's accusing these uh, Pharisees and Sadducees as. I can to that. And he goes on to say, and do not suppose that you can say to yourself, we have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that from these stones, God is able to raise up children of Abraham. The ax is already laid at the root of the trees. Now note this, this symbol of trees here, the root of the trees. People, he's talking about people here. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Now, we know by now what fruit means and what good fruit means. Good uh, fruit is something that stems from the life of, of people in this case, because it's, it's, it's talking about, he's saying a tree here, he's using tree as a symbolic representation of people. So he's saying, if you do not, if you're not producing good fruit, you, you'll cut down and thrown into the fire. And in other words, your, your end is gonna be death. And, uh, and that's what God does for those who continue to rebel and sin and, and does not accept the the uh, sac the sacrifice he sent that will take away their sin, which is Christ. Excuse me. And your other comments here. God's own has his fruit. Okay, the passage above reveals a probing question. Uh, no, a probing request by John the Baptist of the Pharisees who came to be baptized. And what he said was bear fruits to show repentance. Now, true candidates for baptism have repented of their sins and wish to accept salvation in Christ. The fruit John was asking them to bear was a heart prone to accept Christ as their savior, fruit God offers for all mankind. And so John was basically asking the, the the uh, Pharisees for there to show evidence of your belief in Christ, because I haven't seen it. And that's you know basically what he was saying. And so show fruit that that now he didn't use the word prove is is uh, that show your repentance, that show you're ready to accept Christ. And he and then he goes on to make this statement about the brood of vipers, which was a terrible thing, and they knew it. <laughs> uh, so uh, if you get a chance, look up how vipers reproduce, and, <laughs> and you'll, mm -hmm. you'll, you'll, you'll know what John, how bad this is John is saying to them. Okay, so let's go to seed sown by others ready for harvest. And, and this, this is a, well, let's, let's go to the, the word here, and I'll let the word speak before I, <laughs> before I say any more. Uh, but we're going to read John 4, verses 35 through 38. And this is Jesus talking to his disciples. And he said, do you not say there yet four months 
and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say to you, now, before we go on, let's, I want to comment on the first verse. This is something that the, the um, disciples could relate to because they, uh, people in those days, they all know about farming and, and because they, you know, they grew their own food. They didn't have many places, stores like us. It, there were markets there, but they, you can just go somewhere to the store and buy what you need. You rate, most people raise their own. And, and or they knew people who had fields and they bought it from them, from, from, from those people, the farmers. And, and so he's, he's relating to them in terms that they understand clear. Do you not say uh, there are yet four months and then comes, you know the seasons. And so he goes on to say, behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields that they are white for harvest. Now, now, he's not talking about uh, the food, the harvest of the fields. He's talking about people here. And verse 36 says, already he who reaps is receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life. Now, again, this fruit is the, out, the, the what comes from the hearts of those who are here among us, among them, in the fields, wherever they are. And because we are, uh, Jesus was sent to them and he's trying to, he, he's giving them the same type of symbolic representation of, of fields that are producing fruits and people that are producing fruits or, or not, depend on who they are. And verse 36, already he, who reaps is receiving wages and is gathering fruit for life eternal, so that he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. Now, I want to say one other thing here. Now, in, in, in God's work through us, the works of those who have come before us or who maybe some that live across town combines with the works that we do and and that's that's God holds that use utilizes all God's servants to get his mission accomplished to in this case to um, to cause us to keep bearing fruit from him because some are planters and, and cultivators of, of the field and then the field grows and then they're, they're those who come and harvest. Well, in, in a meta, in a symbolic way, we are doing the same thing in this world as God's servants. We're serving him among with other, say, churches or congregations who serve the Lord in a little different way. They do things and they reach out to people and, 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 and say the people find our church and they come out to our church and we pick up where they've left off and we continue that work. So we all work together to serve the Lord and to bring about his fruitfulness. And here Jesus is telling them that, look out the fields, uh, other people have come and sowed seeds and, and the fields are white for harvest. And, and so, so uh, and, 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 the, and he who reaps is gathering fruit for eternal life and some are reapers. And, and so, um, let's move on. There's a couple more verses here to read. And uh, verse 37, for in this case, the saying is true. One sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. Amen. Amen. That's some of what I've said earlier. We have some comments about everything that I've said, and let's see if we can sort of bring that passage together in different words so it'll hopefully give you more understanding. The passages above refer to the theme of fruitfulness woven into God's word throughout the Bible. Now, all the things that we've talked about, or most of the things that we've talked about, we, we pertain to what we just, this whole, uh, everything is coming to a time of harvest. 
and all the work that has been done, all the work of the prophets before have taught people, then they have they have a born bore fruit and 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 shared it with others. And so so now we have many people who are ready for the for, for God who because because the work has been done in them by a collective effort of churches and people who has served the Lord and Lord has guided them and um and so the harvest is near and that's what it, that whole that's what that passage was getting to and uh and I hope my ex explanation is is adequate that you you can see see here what we're doing what God is doing in us and through us so let's let me start over here I've been saying lots of things the passage is above referred to the theme of fruitfulness woven into God's word throughout the Bible. The phrase about fields white for harvest signals the positive results of previous efforts by sowers whose crops have already bore fruit. This alerts us that a time of fruitfulness is near. The Lord is preparing us for a great harvest. Amen. Amen. And so, and, and we can see, we know as Christians, our duty is to go out and seek to bring others to the Lord. And that's, and that's exactly what, what all this is talking about. Others have done some things. They have done, they have gotten good results. And now this all is before you. So you pick that up and you lead and you help to bring about this great harvest for the Lord, for our God, because that's why he has us here to serve in this manner. And he knows when we know what he desires for us to do because he tells us, so there's no, it's no question of what we have to do. So let's go to dying to the law bears fruit for God. And for this, we'll look at Romans seven, verse four. Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ, so that you might be joined to another, to him who has raised, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. Amen. Amen. Now, here we, we see a little different twist. We've been, we've been linked with Christ. We died to the law. And so now we have Christ with us and we have his, the spirit of God in us and, and we're joined with him. So we're not just working alone. Christ is working through us and in us. And he was raised from the dead to do this in order that we might bear fruit for God together with him. And that's our, that's our mission. That's our jobs. That's our role as Christians in serving God. Um, Christ has us, and he gives us all the strength, all the tools, all the encouragement we need to do the work of God and bear fruit for God. Amen. So let's go to walking with God, with knowledge of his will, bears fruit in his work. And that's what we've been saying all through this message in a fit in different ways. Being with, linked with God and Christ, knowing his will, and that'll bear, if we know his will and we do his will, that'll always bear fruit because God, God is the one who directs the fruit bearing. Okay, Colossians 1 verses 9 and 10. And the scripture reads, for this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. 
Now, uh, I, I didn't give you any context for this, but uh, I'll do my best to do that now. In this situation, Paul has said that the gospel is spreading throughout all the world. That is, uh, and, and, and he wishes to encourage the people here to do that work in the Lord that they may continue this work because that's what God desires in them. And then he, and that's why he says, for this reason also, since the day we heard of it, how what the, the word of God was, how it was spread. And, and Paul was quite instrumental in that because he was writing letters to all the churches to teach them. And he had disciples, not disciples, but there were others that Paul had sent to those churches to teach the people and to read his letters. and before them, uh, much as we read this, the, the scripture now and teach each other. And, and uh, that's, this is God's work that we're doing. And, and we pray, we pray for that very thing that the Lord will continue to cause us to do these things, give us the things we need, give us the strength, give, give us the wisdom and the knowledge that we may bear fruit. Bearing fruit and every good work. That's our job, brothers and sisters. That is our job, to bear fruit for God. Amen. So, wisdom from above brings seeds whose fruit is righteousness. And that comes from James. Chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. And the scripture reads, but the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle. Those all sounds like fruits of the spirit, or, or at least some of them. Reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits. Now, even the, the well, of course, the fruits, no wonder it sounds like the fruits of the spirit, full of mercy and good fruits, because that's what the fruits of the spirit are those things that we see up there. Um, unwavering, without hypocrisy. And the seed whose fruit is righteous is sown in peace by those who make peace. Amen. Amen. The seed whose fruit is righteousness. And we know God blesses his people with righteousness. That's our fruit. That's fruit. And when we sow it, that is, when we pass that along to another in peace, um, because we make peace, and that helps them to, to helps, and then God gives them fruit. God causes them to have their own fruit. Amen. Amen. Okay. This brings us to the conclusion, and um, and in this we know that uh, this this process of bearing fruit, or this theme of fruit, extends beyond life in this world. And now we'll look at a vision from heaven here, and this is what uh, John. This is. John's vision of he heaven that he wrote in the book of Revelations. And uh, this is uh, near the end of that book, or if not the last chapter. And so, well, let's read, let's read the passage and we'll see how this fruitfulness that we've been focusing on throughout this message, how it shows up in the afterlife when we're there with God. And here's John's vision. Then he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of his street, on either side of the river, was the tree of life, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding this fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Now we see that God's fruit is taken on 
knew me another level of productibility. Okay. Um, and so verse three, there will no longer be any curse and the throne of God and of the lamb will be in it. And his bond servants will serve him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. We go to verse five. And there will no longer be any night. And they will not have any need of the light of a lamp nor the light of the sun because the Lord God will illuminate them and they will reign forever and ever. Amen. 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 And amen. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for this wonderful message today that you've put in our hearts and, and you've, you've allowed us to deliver it to those who would desire to be in their hearts and, and to know your ways and to know your fruit, that they may continue their efforts in <clears throat> bearing your fruit and bearing it to others, the things that you put in them. And Lord, we just thank you, Lord. We have so much to thank you. We thank you for all the things that you do in our lives. And we just pray that you just continue to bless us and plant us, plant us in your sanctuary as if a tree planted by uh, streams of water that we may bear fruit. And for the days that you have us here upon this earth. And Lord, we thank you for all these things and we give you all the honor, all the praise and all the glory for the lives that you've given to us. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. Amen.